After a 12 year hiatus, Robot Wars was rebooted last year with six new episodes of Mechanical Mayhem. To my surprise, another six episodes were confirmed pretty quickly, and the second series, or Series 9 as I like to call it, was released at the beginning of this year. Things were left pretty tense after the climactic finale between Carbide and Apollo last year, given how impressive the two machines were and the thought of a rematch really excited me. So I tuned in again and thought, I'm sure I can put off making this review for a while, only to find out that another series is being filmed and is due to be released at the end of this month? I'm not gonna lie though, Robot Wars and Robot Wars related content do keep me occupied in my spare time. I seem to find myself either watching Steven's reviews of the toys or re-watching old episodes whenever NJGW uploads them in HD. Please, for the love of God, upload Series 6 and Extreme 2 already! Anyway, since I covered my thoughts on the general layout changes of the reboot in my previous review, I seriously recommend you watch that before watching this video. This review, however, is going to be much more specific, given that there had been next to no changes in the format since Series 8, so without further ado, let's jump into the review. Firstly, however, some housekeeping. Last year I complained about the lack of music during the fights, and I still hold the opinion that the battles feel comparatively empty, but I did notice that you can not only hear the crowd better, but its removal also intensifies the high damage impacts certain robots have with each other, such as when Aftershock smashed into terahertz and Concussion doing basically the same to Thor. Because these fights were two of my favourites of Series 9, I had to make you guys aware that I've changed my mind somewhat on that particular aspect of the reboot. I've also previously criticised the show for not having enough diversity of fights within the tournament without realising that the producers were probably uncertain of how popular the revival would be. I mean, 3,000 people alone wanted to watch my review of it, so there is undoubtedly an audience for it out there. I did a little digging though, and apparently there's going to be a fight with 10 robots in it. The Roboteers and producers are still absolute softies though when it comes to damage. Alright, steady, steady. Let's wait the wait. Spin down, Will. Spin down. Spin no, no, no. down. In case they start up again. For the aftershock, boys. Will and Ian. No, no, don't, Will. Three. Spin down. Because he was trying to drive Spin it, down. Yeah. Mobile. Great win. Great win. He's saying he can't drive. It doesn't matter if they can't go the way they want to go as long as they're moving. Beyond their circumference. Why is nine side three coming in for the kill here? I know it can be considered tactical, and I'm also aware the levels of damage inflicted this year were astronomical in comparison to the classic series, but why is the judges countdown so definitive? Why can't the countdown show up in the corner of our screens and the fight continue until the house robots are done smashing them to pieces? What was the point in giving them these major upgrades if their usage is rarely seen? Rogue House Robots is a nice substitute for this, but is super restricted in its application. There should be a separate button for the Rogue Robots, because you only have 50% chance of acting activating it, and even then, they're only out for about 10 seconds or so. Some of the additions to Series 9 are quite irritating. Firstly, I might have mentioned this before, but I don't know what the advantage is in explaining the rules of the competition at the start of every single episode. I would understand it being in the first episode alone, but I find myself skipping over the first two minutes of each episode because it's always the same. Secondly, funnily enough in the opening two minutes as well, one of the sound effects used here is the Wilhelm scream of all things. Who is screaming here? Robots don't scream. Not yet, anyway. Speaking of strange sounds, the robotic voice that introduces all the robots has the strangest accent. Supernova, spinner, flipper, beta bot, drum spinner. One other general moan I have, however, well, it's not really a moan, but more an observation and opinion, is that certain battles can end so quickly. In fact, just to emphasise the point, not a single one of Carbide's fights lasted more than a minute. Of course, there's not really much you can do about this aside from awe at the sheer power that these machines can produce, but leaves a lot to be desired. Maybe this is just me telling the other Roboteers to step up their game a bit, but when you watch a fight between two equally matched robots, it is super thrilling to watch. Episode 1 contains my favourite robot of the series, Aftershock. I was seriously impressed with the improvement of this machine. It's like they took on board the phrase, offence is the best defence this year because their disc is a mighty, mighty weapon. I think it's just the efficiency at which this machine destroys that impresses me the most. It destroyed Killy Cranky so quickly and didn't flinch at all, not to mention how it demolished any potential adversary that crossed paths with it. Most expensive machine of the series, destroyed. Underdog Sabretooth, destroyed. Terahertz? 
destroyed. Terahertz is still a fantastic machine, but my god, John Reed gets a bit military about tactics, doesn't he? Oh, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it! Wait for a good, wait for a good hit. Hello, darkness, my old... They did prove themselves well against Aftershock, though, which was another fantastic fight, demonstrating their frontal defensive abilities. Sabretooth are a far more impressive machine now, too, and was surprising to hear that they'd never passed the first round of a heat. It's been cool to see these robots with toothed spinning drums succeed into later parts of the tournament. You may also remember Matilda throwing Nuts 2 out of the arena with her flywheel. Now, I'm not sure how to feel about this, because house robots do have the potential to knock out robots instantly if the robot drives into a CPZ. On the other hand, it feels like they were kind of cheated out of the competition because in these first round melees, once you're out, you're out. Episode 2 is unfortunately where things take a bit of a turn for the worst, so I'm going to talk about the best part of this episode first, that being PP3D. These guys are always ahead of the game technologically, last year they being the first robot to be made of 3D parts, and this year being crowdfunded. Speaking of which, you should check out my Patreon page in the description. I also forgot to mention last year that the guy at the helm of this party is the man who drove Typhoon 2, the champions of Series 7. You'd think these guys would have been promoted a bit more besides their innovative design, given they won the British Championship the series before the show got cancelled. I thought it was pretty rubbish as well that the Roboteers don't have a full view of the arena from their booths. You can see the Behemoth team here struggling to see their machine during the Heat semi-finals, whilst it got pulverised by Eruption, whose vision was presumably unimpeded. Jonathan Pierce calls it innovative tactics, I think the designers of the ring should be held accountable for it. Not just that though, during the first fight of the episode, the pit descended and descended back up again twice during the battle for some reason. You might not have noticed this, but I did. That's a foul! Ref, get in there! Oh yeah, they don't have one anymore. You'll know from my previous video that I'm not a massive fan of the head-to-head -head format of the Heat semi-finals, but this year they pushed this frustration to the limit in this episode, episode 3 and episode 4. They did this by sending the two robots that survived their Heat back into the arena to fight each other again, instead of fighting a robot they've yet to face. Not only is this going to bore your audience, but if the second victor also happened to smash the other victor into pieces, then you'll be repairing your robot just to have it smashed up again. This happened in episode 4 with Frostbite and Supernova, and Frostbite had to back out of the competition as a result. Back to the head-to-heads, more silly decisions cause unnecessary issues. Take the fight between Cherub and PP3D. Despite both robots being immobilised at the same time, and PP3D undoubtedly doing more work, Cherub got the win? The judge's decision was questionable here, but the fight between Behemoth and Cherub was one of the dullest fights ever. Behemoth should have seen how easy it was to flip Cherub from their fight against Eruption, and used the flipper instead. The decision against PP3D resulted in a terribly predictable heat final. Credit where credit's due, however, Eruption are a fantastic flipping machine. That young driver seriously has his victory lenses on. His dedication to winning is astounding. This led me to be more excited for the final though, considering two places have been filled by two undefeated and mightily impressive machines. Concussion were just as impressive as Sabretooth, given they're basically the same machines, and Surgeon Pete was back with Mr. Speed Squared, with a video interview that was much less cringy and much more down to earth this year. It tied in nicely with Pete's little thing about getting engaged to his girlfriend after Robot Wars as well. Thor's new design unfortunately didn't live up to expectations, and Concussion's fight against them was terrific. Unfortunately, Heavy Metal came along, and I was so disappointed with their entry this year. Considering this is the genius behind 13 Black, I still don't quite know what their weapon is. This design kind of reminded me of Wheelie Big Cheese. A flipper seriously would have done some wonders for heavy metal, I think. The section in this episode with Noel Sharkey talking about robots saving the planet was also brilliant. The thought that robots are going to be tasked with fixing nature for us, like repairing the coral reef, planting seeds for food, robot bees spreading pollen... Oh wait, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> I always had a soft spot for Supernova, then again I've always liked robots with flywheels so of course I would like them. This new design is absolutely terrific though, it's just a shame they're once again too powerful in comparison to their manoeuvrability. I thought it was a shame Apex went out in its first round. It was obviously going to fail because of how ludicrously big the spinning arm is compared to the body, but when Frostbite had to leave the competition, they could have picked Apex or Worm. Considering Worm's a good contender for the most boring robot ever award, who did they pick? 
worm. It was cool that Ironside 3 finally got to show off a bit more this year, aside from the lack of a Shree mech, as well as the fact they got revenge on Pulsar. Pulsar once again had one of those jammy moments where both they and Ironside 3 fought and tied. This may be a first for Robot Wars, although I have been wrong before, but Ironside 3 should have smashed them into submission. Like that ghastly fight between Hypnodisc and Dominator back in Series 5, the fight left a lot to be desired. I don't really have a lot to say on this episode, but despite the thoroughly entertaining battles the pair shared, and those super dank videos as well, I thought it was a really shitty thing to put Apollo and Carbide in the same heat. It's great on the one hand because you guarantee a face-off between the two, but this was never done in the original series, and none of the other robots in the heat would stand a chance against either of them. I think just having one more heat would have made this whole situation much easier. You wouldn't have to pick one of the heat finalists this way, and you can have another heat for one of the other grand finalists from the previous series to kind of dominate the episode. Seven episodes of any TV show is certainly unusual, but I think that would be the golden number for this new revision of Robot Wars. Too much of a good thing ruined this episode, I think. Can I have a coyote call, please? Go on, Callum. Not from me. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's Jamie's job. Oh, everybody, coyote call. Oh! Is that what a coyote does? The finale was certainly enjoyable, but with Apollo being defeated in the previous episode, then being accepted back in again, and then knocked out in the first round of the finale, I was beginning to get a bit sick of seeing them, to be honest. Aftershock's unchallenged weapon proved once again mightily impressive in this first fight. It's a shame Eruption didn't get the chance to attack Apollo in this fight, but as I said, this guy's got smarts. Just before the second fight, which we knew the outcome of from the moment it started, there's something you might not have noticed here either. Only two go through to the head-to-heads. Well, two of these gang up again to knock out. Two of these gang up again. I have to wonder though, with all the destructive discs we've seen this year, are bars better than discs? I'm not too sure myself. I can only assume that a bar is resistant to blows from an axe and can potentially weigh less. The main disc of victory this year had it placed vertically, but even when put against carbide, Aftershock decided to ditch the disc in exchange for a bar. I'm guessing it all comes down to weight and power ultimately, but this year was definitely the year of the spinners. I don't really mind this at all, as I mentioned before, they're my favourite type of weapon, but only one disc or spinning bar could rule them all. That being carbide. I was not expecting the results it created this year, given that not a single robot could flip or stand a fighting chance against it, due to the speed at which carbide can get the blade spinning. Aftershock really was the main thing I was anticipating to be the downfall of carbide, but as we saw, the latter machine is far more powerful. I can only think of one machine that might have a chance at killing carbide. Storm 2. It's a shame they didn't take part in Series 9 for that reason alone. It's a speedy little robot like that, or even Tornado perhaps, that I think would do the trick. It's a shame Mentor and Media have such a shitty problem with pushers and boxers that Roboteers are put off making robots of that nature. It's not that I'm wishing Carbide failure though, I just wish that they had some competition that was on par with their power, just to spice things up a bit. This is why my favourite fight of the series has to go to Eruption vs Aftershock. A disappointing end, but it seriously kept me on my toes throughout out, and as an example of two robots dueling, if you like, instead of knocking them out in seconds. But that's about all I have to say on this series. Do you think Carbide can be stopped? If so, by who? Or what? Leave your comments below where we will continue this discussion. Or re-watching old episodes whenever NJGW, GW fucking... Your username is a bitch to say, man. <laughs> Flipper. And this year, they pushed this frustration to the limit in this episode. Blah, 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 blah. I seem to find myself... Oh, shit. <laughs>